Welcome, my friends, to the Bomb Brad Podcast. My name is Mike Keenitz, and today I'm interviewing physical therapist Sarah Haig. She is an expert in urinary incontinence and bladder control. She is also the part owner in Entropy Physiotherapy and Wellness and the author of the book, Understanding and Treating Incontinence. So without further ado, here is Sarah. All right. Well, welcome back to the program, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me back. We're glad to have you back. It's been uh, well over a year since you were on last. I think you talked to Bob last time. I sure did. All right. We're going to get started. So would you mind telling us your backstory? Um, sure. Well, my name is Sarah Haig, and I'm a doctor of physical therapy. Um, and I've been a specialist in an official board certified specialist in women's health for just over 12 years, I think. Um, but very soon after I specialized, I transitioned into, well, helping people with pelvises. So um, 10 years ago, I opened Entropy Physiotherapy and Wellness with Dr. Sandy Hilton. And here I get to help people with all of the things nobody likes to talk about, such as sexual dysfunction, bowel issues, and of course, urinary incontinence. Yeah, those are probably the least uh, common practiced areas in physical therapy, I think, if, for people that don't know that. I was going to say, it's definitely been growing in pract practitioner-wise, but I always say the amount of people who need help and don't even know that there's help is so, like the numbers are just staggering. Um, and already, even when people know they need help, the wait list in some places are six to eight weeks, even months longer than that. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's still not being talked about quite as much as we'd like, but it is growing and um, you guys have actually helped us tell people that there is help if you want it. Oh, good. Yeah. When I searched your name, uh, your old videos came up right away. So they must've done decent. <laughs> they, uh, they, they, yeah. They're still out there somewhere. <laughs> so where can people find out more information about you at? Ah, they can come to um, Entropy Physiotherapy website. So the website is super easy. It's just Entropy, E-N-T-R-O-P-Y dot physio, P-H-Y-S-I-O. And then you're on all other social media platforms too? I am not great at Instagram, but I am on Twitter at um, Sarah Haig PT. Okay. Uh, do you see people online too or just in person? Uh, I... I also see people online. So if you're in the state of Illinois, we can actually do official telehealth. But also I've had some great conversations, um, basically consultations or educational sessions with people who live outside of the state. Okay, well, perfect. All right, so we're going to start talking about urinary incontinence. So first question is what causes urinary incontinence? Great question. Um, there's actually a lot of different things that can cause urinary incontinence. Um, some people have the misconception that it's just a weak pelvic floor, but it, it can be a little bit more complicated than that. So it might be easier to talk about what, how do we stay continent? <laughs> and basically, to stay dry, what we need is we need some sort of closure on our urethra, which is that tube that goes from our bladder to the outside world. So that can be our urinary sphincters, our pelvic floor, our pelvic floor muscles, um, helping keep that closed. But then also it requires our bladder, which actually has a smooth muscle around it, to kind of stay relaxed. So we have a little bit of tension down here and our, our bladder's kind of relaxing. And then as that bladder fills up, um, eventually we'll have a little stretch and um, that's kind of what gives us the urge to go to the bathroom. So when our bladder starts to stretch at a certain amount of fluid in there, it makes us feel like we got to go to the bathroom. When we go to the bathroom and we relax the pelvic floor and that bladder muscle, the detrusor squeezes everything out. So that's when everything's working together. They kind of work together, but are doing opposite things. One's relaxing while the other one's working. Incontinence happens when the pressure on the inside of the bladder and or our intra-abdominal cavity, which is basically everything below our breathing diaphragm, down to our pelvic floor. Um, so if the pressure in there becomes higher than our ability to close that urethra or keep it squeezed shut, um, that's when we have a leak. So it's kind of like this imbalance in the equation. So <laughs> what causes incontinence? Sometimes it is some weakness in the pelvic floor. 
sometimes it's that the like the urethra or the bladder has become hypermobile. And so it, it doesn't stay supported and in the right spot. Um, for men, one of the things that might happen is that um, if they have prostate cancer, an issue that causes the prostate to be removed, they actually lose some of their urethra and perhaps some of their sphincter. So now that's one of those contributing factors to their incontinence. Um, going up higher to the bladder, it can also be overactive bladder. So, you know, some people say they just have a small bladder or they um, feel like they have to go to the bathroom all the time. That's actually that bladder muscle, again, which is a smooth muscle, which really we don't have direct control over, but um, we can kind of condition it and train it. Maybe that's squeezing too much all the time. And that's in a, in a person where their neurological system is intact, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there's a lot of other reasons involving more of like the um, neurology of, of bladder function that, that could cause urinary incontinence. So it's not one thing, basically. It could be many causes, right? Could be many causes. And actually, something I'll talk to my patients about is sometimes it's a bunch of little things that added up to the incontinence. <clears throat> so if they have an empty bladder, they can run a 5K. If they have a cup of coffee, which might make their bladder a little twitchy because it makes some people's bladders irritated, and they have a slightly weak pelvic floor, and they go running, now they leak. So sometimes it's a couple of different things feeding into that episode of incontinence. It, is coffee because of the caffeine, or why does that cause problems? Great question. So there isn't tons of really strong like research on um, irritants for bladders. We just know for some people, caffeine, um, some other common ones are carbonation, artificial sweeteners, citrus juices. For some people, it really makes their bladder want to empty. Um, huh. But it's, I will say, in my clinical practice, this is not across the board. Um, so if you're like, wow, I go to the bathroom all the time, but I love my coffee, what do I do? I'll have people do a voiding log so we can kind of look at when are your issues happening and how much do we think is the coffee having to do with it? Because I had one person get way better when they drank as much coffee as they wanted. Huh. That's fascinating. <laughs> oh. All right. Uh, next question is how is urinary incontinence <laughs> diagnosed? So when I looked at this question, the first thing that popped in my head is that somebody will tell you. <laughs> so people usually can self-identify when they're leaking urine. Um, I will also say, though, that sometimes um, in the clinic, in different medical settings, we can actually observe it. So sometimes people will do like a cough test or they'll bear down and actually the, the incontinence can be visualized. Um, and then there is another test which I would say isn't done as a first line of, of treatment or investigation for people, um, called urodynamics, where this is a, and I can go into more detail if you'd like, but it's kind of an involved test, which actually will tell us what people's bladder sensation is like. So is it an accurate sensation? What are their pelvic floor and their sphincters doing? What's that detrusor muscle around the bladder doing? And they can really start to identify where in the system is the problem causing this incontinence? I'm presuming that's a pretty uh, hands-on test. It's involved. So it does involve a catheter in the urethra and then a pressure gauge either in the vagina or in the rectum. Um, and then filling the bladder with saline while um, you can kind of visualize um, the, the catheter actually has uh, electrodes, so you can actually gauge the activity of the pelvic floor, the sphincters, and the detrusor. Sure. It's pretty cool, um, but also as you pretty hands-on and pretty involved. So not not the first choice for diagnosis. <laughs> I, I would assume not. I, I'm learning a lot today. I mean, I worked in therapy, but I never <laughs> dealt with this realm of stuff. So, okay. So, what are the different types of urinary incontinence? <clears throat> Well, there are actually, like there's a lot of different reasons you can experience incontinence. There are a lot of different types of incontinence. 
The most common incontinence is called urge incontinence. Now, this is the incontinence um, where it, the leak is preceded by a strong urge to go to the bathroom. Um, and this can be um, become quite inconvenient because, of course, most of us, when everything's working well, we'll have an urge to go to the bathroom. And we have abundant time to find the bathroom, manage our clothing, do our business. Um, the urge incontinence, though, might not happen on the way to the bathroom, but that's kind of a lot of, uh, you'll hear about that a lot, like, ooh, I couldn't make it to the bathroom. So it's just that bladder just starts to squeeze and we leak. So that leak is preceded by that strong urge. That's actually the most common cause of, or the common type of incontinence. Um, the next most common type is stress incontinence. So stress incontinence, I think, is talked about a lot more. Um, this is a type of incontinence that I would say very generally would respond best to doing Kegels or pelvic floor exercises. I say that with an asterisk, and we can talk about that later, more about that later. Um, but this is incontinence that happens when you have an increase in that intra-abdominal pressure and your bladder is not really over full. Um, so if your bladder... If you empty your bladder and then you go on the trampoline and you leak urine, that's stress incontinence. If you leak when you cough, laugh, or sneeze, that's stress incontinence. Um, yeah, just anything. Or if you're lifting weights, that would be stress incontinence. And oh. then we have something. Oh, do you have another question? No, that's fine. I was just, I was, first of all, I was thinking of like mental stress, like not actual physical oh. Funny story is that I I would say that that mental stress and um, things like that actually make urge incontinence worse for some people. Like if, say, you have, if you have worries. Yeah, when you it feels like when you have to do something like something in public, like say public speaking, I've noticed like I also don't have to go to the bathroom out of nowhere. I don't know if that's what that, that counts as that. Well, as long as you don't leak urine, it doesn't count. Well, <laughs> but yes, it's that. Like you don't have to share that much. But, but yeah, it's um, not but, urinary continence, but the urge, I should say. But but that like kind of nervousy bladder, yeah. So that is that is, um, and it doesn't necessarily correlate. Like I didn't just drink six cups of coffee, and I just went to the bathroom. Why am I having this feeling? That's more of a perception and a nervous system thing than um, a stressful thing, than um, an actual bladder function thing. Sure. Um, but then we do have also mixed incontinence, which people have symptoms of both stress incontinence and urge incontinence. And I think that's a really important type to talk about because some people will try a treatment, be it physical therapy, be it um, medication, be it surgery. And they're like, eh, it's a little bit better, but it's not gone. It's not all the way better. And I think a lot of times it happens because the treatments for stress incontinence are um, uh, different than the, the ones for the ones for stress incontinence are different than the ones for urge incontinence um, in many cases. So if you do something to address one type, it should get better. But if you didn't do anything to address that other component, then it's not all the way better. How do you differentiate? Do you just try different strategies with them and see what works or? Great question. So I would say most of the time, this is figured out based on their history and their description of when it happens. And um, also, if we use something called avoiding log, where people will kind of keep track of um, their fluid intake, maybe their, their food intake as well. And then when they go to the bathroom, how much are they going? How badly did they have to go? And um, if any leakage was present. And then I always tell people, look, just don't change a thing. Fill it out. If you can record what goes on for three or four days, bring it back. And I can look at those data points and start to identify. It happens when you're jumping, running, coughing, or it's more on the way to the bathroom or it's preceded by that super strong urge. Um, you can kind of differentiate by that. Sure. So I guess this is a good segue to the next question. What are the treatment options for urinary incontinence? Uh, I am 
biased, but also super happy to say that most um, guidelines recommend conservative treatment first. So that would involve things like exercise, behavior change, um, bladder training, which would all fall under what a pelvic floor physical therapist could help someone with. Um, in fact, I've also taught a class called uh, Pelvic Health for Non-Pelvic Health Practitioners, because once you start asking people about their bladder function, you will learn all of your patients have a bladder, and many of them, male, female, um, just people with bladders, have issues that, that are a bother, and they didn't know that there was help. Um, so physical therapy is definitely an option. Um, and like I said, that could involve exercises or it could involve um, some sort of behavioral change, like looking at is your are your bladder symptoms worse when you have coffee or wine or something else? Or is it not related to what you're drinking at all? So we can kind of look at um, lifestyle areas to address. Um, but then there are medications and surgeries um, that are available. Uh, and I can say that very generally, the medications are typically more for the urge incontinence or overactive bladder syndrome um, symptoms. So those tend to help that bladder muscle relax a little bit. Um, so that I would say is probably the most common medication for incontinence. I am not aware of any pharmaceutical interventions for, um, for stress incontinence. Um, for stress incontinence, I would say surgery um, is, is used more often for that. And that is usually to help support the bladder or to support the urethra so that everything's kind of a little bit more snug and firmly held in place. Um, and there is, there is one more surgery for urge incontinence. There are sacral um, stimulators that actually it's implanted to impact those sacral nerves that go to the bladder. Um, and though that has been improving over the years, but again, that is not a first line um, treatment, but that is something that's out there. That sounds very new and technological. <laughs> <laughs> it's So it's been around for a while, um, but again, I haven't seen a ton of it in my practice in the last decade. And I always wonder if that's because they get the stimulator and do great or if they're just never getting to um, to me in particular as a practitioner. Do a lot of people have to come to therapy after they have surgery to kind of do both, still strengthen it after operations? Great question. I would say, at least in America, that is not standard of practice. Um, I have worked with some urologists and urogynecologists over the years who um, – do have their patients undergoing these surgeries, um, do have them do kind of a prehab to make sure that that pelvic floor um, is working as well as possible and that, you know, that they have a good, healthy, um, good, healthy bladder habits before they go into surgery. Um, and also another thing sometimes we address preoperatively is actually constipation because that can actually lead to some issues for the bladder and for um, bearing down and, and changing um, how those bladder suspensions might work. Um, so we see a lot of people prehab. I don't see as many people post-surgery as, um, as maybe I would like to, at least to see how they're doing. But again, it, it's always a question of, are they doing so well they don't need us or were they not referred back and didn't know there was more help? Sure. Do you... Would you mind showing our audience like one basic exercise to help from a physical therapy perspective? Oh, yeah. So it's actually going to look like me sitting here, but I can talk you through it. Sure. <laughs> All righty. So we are going to do the mysterious pelvic floor contraction, also known as a Kegel um, or a Kegel, depending on where you are. So sitting so that you feel both of your sits bones. Um, sitting firmly on the surface, whatever you're on, and then just sitting up nice and tall. And we can do this a couple different ways. So this is going to take a minute or two to feel all the different things. So the pelvic floor goes from our pubic bone in the front all the way back to our tailbone and out to the sides of our sits bones, our ischial tuberosities. So when we squeeze it, nothing else should move. 
except for the muscles underneath, basically what would be sitting on a bicycle seat. So we're going to try the most, I would say the most classic cue, and then we're going to go from there. So what I'd like you to do is to squeeze like you don't want to pass gas in public. Keep squeezing while you breathe in and out. Nice, normal breath. And then relax it. Now, this is when I would say, I would want to know, what did you feel? Are you asking me what I felt? <laughs> no, like I was did holding it if I had to go to the bathroom. Yeah, my... So okay. I, I think so, we, so should, we should clarify, you shouldn't feel your butt cheek clenching. It's like deeper than that. Correct. Like more to the middle. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll tell people, right. Cause not everyone consents for a pelvic floor exam. So if we do a pelvic floor exam, I can tell definitely what the muscles are and are not doing, but not everybody is in a place where they're um, ready for such an exam. So I'll tell people, if I see you do this, that probably wasn't the right muscle. So if you're getting taller, if your face scrunches, if your shoulders go, this should be an, um, when you squeeze your pelvic floor muscles, nobody should know. Um, at least if you're dressed, no one should know. Um, so, but, but that, that's a very classic cue. Um, but also we're learning more and more that when you say squeeze, like you don't want to pass gas, the back part of our pelvic floor activates a lot. Well, usually urinary incontinence is in the front part. So what do we do with that? So some other cues that actually have been studied more in males, but actually clinically with some slight changes in words um, has worked well with many of my other patients who aren't males is to actually draw in the penis. Can I say penis on the podcast? <laughs> that's, that's an anatomy term. <laughs> Um, so if you, so I want you to, like anyone who's listening, just try that. So even if you don't have one, imagine what that would be like and see one, if you can do it, but two, did it feel different than squeezing? Like you don't want to pass gas. Yeah, I will. I will say on the guy side of things, it's not as strong as the backside, but you should be able to tell a difference. Definitely. And so I like to talk through with people because if you're going to do a, any exercise to meet a particular goal, you want to make sure that you're doing it right. And finding those muscles can be really hard for people. So having a pelvic floor exam can actually be really helpful for people like I have no idea because then we can use those tactile cues and give you that feedback. But like I said, like in the COVID world, we've done a lot more telehealth there's lots of people who, like I said earlier, just aren't in a place to do that. So I like to talk them through and, and, and we figure out like, can you feel that tension? And then do you feel it let go? And sometimes the answer is yes. And sometimes the answer no is no. And we just kind of go from there because like with any muscle, you should contract it. And then when you stop contracting it, it should relax. And your pelvic floor is no different than any other muscle in that regard. Is there like a certain time they should hold it for or repetitions they should do or? Um, great question. I'm going to say that it's, it's variable and very dependent upon the situation. Um, what I would say in general is I don't have people hold it much longer than 10 seconds. And one easy way to do that is to, when you do your contraction, so if you do your contraction and you just breathe in and breathe out and then do that again and then relax, you just did a 10 second contraction, approximately. Um, and so I'll usually just have people squeeze, keep squeezing as they breathe twice and then relax. And again, this is when I haven't had the benefit of doing a pelvic floor exam. I'll say, how many can you do before you can't feel it anymore? Um, and if they can do 10 really easily, and then they can do three sets of 10 really easily. Um, I start to, um, and they're still having issues with incontinence. We need to kind of look at what else might be happening other than pelvic floor, potential pelvic floor issues, or is that a person who needs to come in and have an exam to make sure they're doing it right? Because if they really can do that many that well, it might not be the pelvic floor that needs to change. Sure. Uh, all right. I'm going to get on to the next topic, I think. 
we explained that pretty well. <laughs> is urinary continence incontinence more common in women or men? Women, unequivocally, equivocally, women. Um, and there's some theories on that, but probably the strongest theory is that um, one, we have a very short urethra. So when you think about, say, a garden hose, if you turn on the faucet and it's a short hose, you're going to have pretty strong water coming out. If that hose goes all the way to the back of the yard, that pressure isn't going to be so strong at the end of that longer hose. So that's one thing. The other thing is that in our pelvic floors, um, because in a uh, female pelvic floor or someone who's born with a vagina, um, there's a larger opening in the pelvic floor called the urogenital hiatus. Um, so where men have a pelvic floor that really comes together and the urethra just kind of punctures through it, um, a female pelvic floor tends to have a larger gap. So even if someone has never had a baby or a vaginal birth. Um, we already have a little less muscle right there in the middle. Um, and then also if you add in someone who's gone through pregnancy, we have pressure on the pelvic floor over the course of 10 months. And then if it's a vaginal birth, we have that pelvic floor stretching a lot. Um, so those are all things that increase the likelihood of, of females having more urinary incontinence than, than a male. Sure. And yeah, I'm assuming if you have more children, are you more prone to develop it later or? Um, yes. So having more children, especially if it, they are vaginal births and especially if there's any sort of instrumentation, um, involved that increases the likelihood of, um, muscle injury or tearing. Um, the more often you do it, yes, the more, um, I, I would say the more likely you, uh, the increased risk you would have for urinary incontinence. Is there, I, so when I think of urinary incontinence, I normally think of older generations, you know, 60, 70 plus. I'm assuming you still see young people periodically, don't you? Yes. And actually the, um, that you see it in the people you wouldn't expect. So some risk factors as people age um, that might cause urinary incontinence, you wouldn't anticipate seeing any of those with, with younger people, but high level female athletes actually can have, depending on the sport, a fairly high level of urinary incontinence. Um, in fact, I was speaking with a gymnastics coach and they actually, um, kind of choose their leotards based on the color that will not show that when that happens. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and it's just kind of, it's normalized. And I'll say you never want to make fun of someone, but I think also ignoring it certainly doesn't make it go away. Um, so yeah, so we we see high rates of urinary incontinence and pelvic floor dysfunction in general in um, gymnasts, um, runners, um, dancers, but then also like it's certainly not isolated to those those athletic events. Is that just because they're more you know, lower extremity oriented sports and flexibility based, or why does that happen to them? I would say the research is still out on that. It's certainly being looked at more often. Um, I think one of the theories going is that um, it would almost be like an, uh, more of like a high tone pelvic floor as opposed to a weakness. Cause most of these athletes, um, well, in some of these studies, these athletes haven't had any children um, or any pregnancies. So, um, Kind of like if you imagine my bicep, let me see which way to go. Okay. So if I, if I have my muscle here and I have a ginormous bicep, looks like I'm super strong, but if I can't straighten my arm, is that strength very helpful or is it really strong or is it just stuck? Um, so you want muscles to be functional. They have to contract and relax. So um, with a pelvic floor, it should contract, but also relax. So that's why when we were doing the pelvic floor contractions is I, I asked, okay, did you feel that tension? And then did you feel it let go? Cause both parts are equally important. Um, and if I were to share my clinical experience, um, I haven't, I'm not aware of any large studies, but I have seen many more people in the last, I would say four to five years 
where their issue was not weakness, but rather their inability to relax their pelvic floors. Sure. I've, I've never heard, that. I would not expect athletes to have this problem. Cause I, yeah, like you said, I think stronger muscles, why, why would this happen? But mm -hmm. huh, that's very fascinating. Mm -hmm. So how can someone manage their urinary incontinence on a daily basis? Great question. So again, part of it's going to depend on, um, on the type of incontinence that they have. And one of the things that you'll see on the television is that to, to just manage it with continence pads, right? So you can buy a pad, put it in there. Um, it'll just catch the urine. And I will say, thank goodness those exist. There are people who like, if that helps you stay active, if that, um, helps you get out of the house, these are great things. But unfortunately, I think too often, as I would say women in particular, um, shrug their shoulders, go to the store and buy some and really don't look at the other things that they might be able to change um, to improve or eliminate their incontinence. Um, so some of the things that you can do is one, exercise. So we already talked a little bit about pelvic floor exercises in general, but also just being fit reduces your risk and can reduce your incontinence. So being a healthy weight, having good cardiovascular fitness, all of these are things that can help lower your risk uh, or lower the incidence of urinary incontinence. Um, and then some other things, and I actually already mentioned it a little bit, is um, managing constipation. <laughs> so having good bladder and bowel habits uh, making sure that that um, bowel is emptying well can actually improve bladder function because we don't think about our bowel and our bladder being that close to each other. But if we look inside, they're actually, they are very close to each other. And if we do have constipation, say in our rectum, it can kind of crowd the bladder and make it more likely to leak and a little bit more irritable. Um, smoking is not good for much, and it is really not good for our bladders. Um, two reasons. One, it does increase your risk of bladder cancer, but also the coughing. So our pelvic floor, again, is just like any other muscle. And when we cough, we tend to stress the pelvic floor. And so if you cough once or twice, we should absolutely be able to stay continent. But if we're coughing all the time, those muscles definitely fatigue, and we're going to increase the likelihood that we're going to have incontinence. Um, looking at diet, so like I said, there are some things that irritate some people's bladders, but before you give up all the things you love in life and drink only water, um, I always recommend do a voiding log, even if it's on your own, to go, whoa, I didn't drink any plain water today, and every time I had that carbonated water, I had to go to the bathroom really bad. So sometimes people can figure this out on their own. It's not a secret for healthcare providers. You know your bodies as well as any, well, better than anyone else. Um, and then behavior. So sometimes when I bring up, well, we might have to look at, um, you know, like changing some behaviors, people can get a little bit like, oh, what are we going to do? But when people have experienced incontinence or are concerned that they are going to be incontinent, they sometimes change their behaviors like, well, at one extreme, not leaving the house ever, but other times um, going to the bathroom just in case. So they'll go out for a day, but they will know where all the bathrooms are and they will hit every one along the way just in case. That can start. So I do explain it this way. It can make our bladder a little lazy. So our bladder is supposed to be able to fill up and hold like four to 600 milliliters a fluid, right? So that's, that's a couple of cups. But if every time it gets this full, I go and empty it, my um, perception and my understanding of what's happening in my bladder can shift a little bit and go like, oh, I can empty now. And it'll actually prefer to empty sooner and more often rather than let it fill all the way up. So we're actually training ourselves to go to the bathroom more often. And so then we need to look at that and say, okay, can we start lengthening the trips between the bathroom? Because really, um, when we're looking at norms, so I don't want anyone to get super nervous if they ever go more than this, really we're looking at just getting up zero to one time a night if 
you're 65 or under, and one to two times a night if you're 65 or over. And during the day, we're looking at, well, actually over a 24-hour period, we're looking at just six to seven times to the bathroom a day to urinate. And, you know, I've had patients where they go 30 times a day. Okay, we need to take a look at that and figure out what do we need to do? Is it changing your fluid intake? Is it using some sort of distraction? Is it a breathing exercise? What do we need to do so that you can stay out of the bathroom longer and stay dry? What if someone drinks lots of fluids? Can they go more than six to seven times a day? Yes. And I always, I, I always like to educate people that your, your bladder function is your own and we're all different. And those numbers I just gave you right now are norms, right? And like some of us are like at that edge of normal anyway, in a lot of ways. Um, and um, so it's, I, I only offer any assistance when it's a bother for people. So if you're drinking a lot of fluid for some reason, and you're going to the bathroom for some reason, that's something else the voiding law could tell us. It's like, yep, input, output, nice and even. Good job, bladder and kidneys. Um, but some people um, drink a lot and then are bothered by how much they're going to the bathroom. And we then we kind of need to figure out the whole person picture. And by that, I mean, okay, so why are you drinking so many fluids? Um, you know, some people are doing it for perceived fitness. Some are doing it for assistance in weight loss. Some people, you know, some people just think that's how much they're supposed to drink. Um, uh, and sometimes it can cross over into an unhealthy amount of fluids. So it's really just about, all right, if you're working out super hard and you feel good drinking this much fluid and you're okay going to the bathroom, I feel like we don't have a whole lot to talk about as long as you're not leaking. But if it's distressing in some way, sometimes that's a hard conversation to figure out why they're choosing to drink so much and why it bothers them so much coming out. Sure. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure I use the bathroom more than that a day, but I don't take a <laughs> log <laughs> track of everything. But I don't have urinary incontinence, so I'm not too concerned about it. One of the questions was, can urinary incontinence be cured or only managed? And ultimately, urinary incontinence can be resolved, um, meaning go away completely um, for, for some people. And I think that it's fair to have that expectation. Um, but kind of like a lot of areas of our health, you know, we have to do things to take care of ourselves to stay healthy. Um, and I think if we do that, there are many people who, who can be you want to call it cured of urinary incontinence. Sure. I'm sure it's a long process, but if you stick to it, these things can correct themselves over time. All yeah. right. And sometimes it's, I was going to say just real quick, sometimes it's not as long as people think it'll take. Sometimes small changes can make a huge difference. Um, so it's not always a huge mountain to climb. Sometimes it's just a tiny little change and there you go. You're good to go. Well, thank you for joining us today. Is there anything else you would like to add? No, I guess just anyone listening, like if urinary incontinence is impacting your life in a negative way, and it can have a huge impact, negative impact on quality of life, please reach out to somebody. Talk to your doctor, find a local pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, I'm happy to help in any way I can. Um, but just know that there are so many options other than just diapers for the rest of your life. Sure. Well, thank you for joining us today. All right. Thanks for having me.